Well, this is attorney Mark Lopez, and I am on the phone with my friend, Joshua Claiborne, who I have known since law school, we graduated together back in 2006, and Josh has made a name for himself throughout the state of Indiana, and particularly the southern part of the state, where he has represented government, state governments, local governments, um, municipalities, utility regulations, but he also has a uh, vibrant intellectual property uh, practice as well. Josh, am I missing anything? Uh, no, I really appreciate that. Yeah, we've known each other for quite a long time, and uh, I, having represented many municipalities and utilities throughout the state, uh, you know, this intersection of governmental power and, and this pandemic we're facing has really been an interesting one for me, and I'm sure for many of your listeners. Well, yeah, and so I'm getting questions uh, nonstop. Now that the governor of Indiana has said, hey, restaurants, bars um, are closed, I believe now at this point gyms are closed, or even saying keeping – gatherings under, he said 50, I think the president is saying under 10, but people are asking me, like, how can they enforce this? Is this legal? And so I really could not think of a better person to talk to about these issues than you. And so if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask some questions. Does that work? That sounds great. Um, I guess just to clarify out of the outset, I am a licensed attorney here in the state of Indiana, um, but our uh, conversation here is for informational purposes, um, not necessarily legal advice, and to the extent you um, plan to move forward with anything, certainly you want to seek uh, professional counsel um, before you do that. Like, like all the good attorneys, the disclaimer is important. And so just right. like you said, this is a starting point. If you're having issues, reach out to Josh. If he can't help you, he will find someone who can. But, you know, do not act on this information. This is truly for informational purposes. So, right. um, Josh, we're going to just start at the beginning. But, like, where does the power to quarantine and close businesses come from? Well, uh, in, in our federal system in the United States, state state governments themselves have tremendously wide latitude to uh, regulate public health, to protect public health, and they have tremendous police powers. The federal national government does not necessarily have that. Um, they can offer all sorts of recommendations, uh, guidelines, and you've seen the Centers for Disease Control and Infection, commonly called the CDC, do that. Um, but most of what they do is simply that, recommendations. Um, much more beyond that would really be a, a stretch under the Commerce Clause. Um, they can regulate or uh, dictate certain things as it relates to commerce between the states, but it doesn't give them very many police powers. Um, most of this is the rest with the state, and so for better or worse, um, our state governments have tremendous power to do nearly anything to act on behalf of the public health. And, and so, Josh, just for anybody listening to this, why does the governor have so much authority in these situations? Right, and I, you know we have to keep in mind we don't we don't live in dictatorships here in the United States. I mean we sometimes forget that, um, and unfortunately, increasingly so, we tend to think that the executive branch can do whatever it wants. You know we have different branches of government, and so um, any law or action that the government takes has to, in some way, shape, or form, be blessed by and passed by the legislature. Um, and so uh, that includes any sort of action the governor might take. Um, so virtually every action that the governor has taken in Indiana has been blessed by the legislature in some form. Um, and so what they do is if the governor declares a state of emergency, then he's given a broad range of powers. And so that is what the legislature has done. And so effectively the governor has declared a state of emergency by executive order. And so now he's got under his power and authority all sorts of different um, actions he can take. And then, so, you know, before the governor of Indiana took action, the mayor of Indianapolis, and you know, I know we're, the whole state might be listening to this, but the mayor of Indianapolis made some very broad statements, you know, closing restaurants, you have you such and such time to be closed. Um, does the mayor, does any mayor have that kind of authority, or where does that come from? Well, once again, the state legislature has empowered many um, of the executives, and so that's both county commissioners and mayors, um, you know, town councils to the extent that they don't have mayors. I mean, they they're, they have quite a lot of authority, and then also health departments themselves have quite a, a bit of independent authority. 
to act on their own in the event that there's been an emergency declared. Now, the state government can trump those. All cities, towns, counties, they are creations of the state government, and so they only have the power and authority to act to the extent that the state government has authorized them or delegated that authority to them. So, you know, at any point the governor can trump that, can be more restrictive and in many situations he has, but if if the state does not act in a particular area or a particular way, in a situation of emergency, many mayors, as happened in Indianapolis, have the power to do that um, on their own, too. So in the event of a conflict, state controls, but the local correct. government can do more restrictive things. Correct. It, generally speaking, that's correct, yeah. And so one of the questions that I'm getting, especially from uh, just, you know, Facebook friends, family, is, you know, it's a violation of my First Amendment rights to be shutting down my church. I don't have to honor that or... They can't tell me what restaurants I can and cannot go to. Um, so shutting down or telling people not to go to a restaurant or trying to limit church services, is that a violation of the First Amendment? Well, it, I think it would be problematic if, if a state government said you cannot attend church services um, and just left it at that. Um, I think the, the reason this is going to be upheld or would be upheld to the extent it was challenged is because this is pretty evenly applied. Um, to gatherings of all types. I mean, they may, some governors may include churches as an example in a list of other things, but it's not targeted to one particular type of, of view or to one particular type of gathering. It's relatively content neutral on how these are applied. Um, you know, even in a situation where, and you, you'll, you know, you recall this from, from, um, from law school, uh, if, if there's uh, the need for strict scrutiny, which sometimes a court will apply when they're assessing whether a um, law is constitutional, um, that rule is going to have to compel a governmental interest and be narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Um, I think, given the circumstances of this, um, this um, medical emergency, that if you have a pretty generally applied um, ban on gatherings of a certain size, um, that's going to be upheld as, as uh, even under strict scrutiny and be, be found to be constitutional. So they're not picking on church. So it's basically everything. Correct. And that's that's Correct. kind of why it survives. I got gotcha. you. And then yeah. um, another question I'm getting, especially got a lot of uh, server clients, got a lot of people that own restaurants, and they're messaging me asking me, hey, what happens if I don't actually shut down? What if I'm right. for, and what if you know, What if I refuse to close my doors and I allow people to eat inside my restaurant? Um, right. What, what, is, what can the state do? Well, and, you know, I, my phone's been blowing up about this as well. And, you know, I, I think we've got a great governor, but I think, unfortunately, on this particular issue, we haven't been given the clarity we probably need. Um, you know, as we've talked about, the governor has sweeping powers um, in, in the situation of a public health emergency, and that's been declared. So he certainly has the power to shut down gatherings which would inc including um, or even directed at bars, nightclubs, and restaurants. But, um, you know, you look at the statute that gives the governor powers, and for those following along at home, that's Indiana Code 10-14-3-12. It applies to an executive order or a proclamation. And really what the governor did yesterday was I issue a directive in the form of a press con press release. And the 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 issue dealing with bars and restaurants was a single sentence. It was not a formal executive order. I I think one could argue it's not even a formal proclamation. And then further, the, the state law requires that to the extent you issue an executive order or proclamation exercising emergency gubernatorial powers, that then eventually has to be uh, filed with the Secretary of State and with the clerk, clerk of the city or town affected. Um, and uh, look, the governor knows how to issue executive orders. He does it regularly. He did as it relates to the public health emergency. And for whatever reason, chose not to. You look at our surrounding states, Illinois, for instance, they closed down their restaurants and bars, and that was done via executive order, very clearly following the statute that 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 applies to. Um, you know, that was not done here. So I I do I do think that we're in a gray area here. Um, you know, if I'm advising a local municipality, I would really feel uncomfortable telling them that they have the authority to go shut down a bar or restaurant that chooses to stay open. You know, I think, you know, that's really ultimately going to be uh, up to the state to probably um, enforce that. 
um, I think um, it's going to require some clarity from the governor ultimately to know our path forward. Um, you know, I would never tell someone that go ahead and flaunt this directive, right? I, you know, this is certainly a public health emergency, and so I'm not at all suggesting that. I'm simply suggesting that we're in a gray area here that that could, that uh, is not very clear as to what someone's uh, responsibilities are truly legally at the end of the day, and so I'm hopeful at some point the governor may clear this up. You know, it's possible the governor is simply, in a roundabout way, offering a strongly worded suggestion that we <laughs> bars and restaurants and nightclubs close down, right? But there's no, it's not clear there's legal legal force behind that. No, that's that's super interesting, and, um, you know, it, I, I, will, I think they reflect, I think the fact that this is a little bit unclear might reflect the fact that, hey, this is kind of a really weird time. And, right. Um, yeah. So I've got super. I, I do thank you for explaining that. And that has been just coming up nonstop. And so, um, you know, for the restaurants, businesses that do follow the governor's directive, are they going to be able to sue the state for lost earnings under the well, amendment? Well, and I, I, I do not doubt we'll eventually see these kind of lawsuits come up. Um, you know, the Fifth Amendment reads that. Private property effectively reads that private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. And so I think the question becomes, does closing down bars and restaurants for a public health emergency um, constitute a public taking? Um, and it's, the short answer is it's not clear, and I know people hate that when lawyers say that, but it's just not. Um, we don't have a lot of case law um, on this type of situation. Um, you know, obviously, if you're being deprived of an economically beneficial use, from the perspective of the property owner, that's going to be deprivation of property. But I think the state is going would argue that the closures are for short term, they're for um, a justified emergency, and that they're still offering the ability to have takeout and delivery. Um, so at the end of the day, any court that would review a case like that, it's going to be a balancing test. And the owner would have to prove that the closures interfered with a reasonable investment back expectation. Um, I, I think maybe it's possible under certain circumstances. Um, you know, if I'm a gambling man, I'd probably say that you're not going to win that lawsuit as it stands right now, but, it, you know, it's possible. Uh, there was a 2002 case, and actually, interestingly enough, Chief Justice Roberts was one of the judges on this in 2002, where they found a 24- and 8-month closure was not considered a taking because fluctuations in property value were not considered constitutional takings. Now, you know, this is a little different. It's not necessarily property value. It's actual revenue. Um, so it doesn't apply directly. But I think for, um, you know, it's one of, the, one of the closest analogies we have to an actual closing of a restaurant or bar, and that was not considered a taking. But, you know, the, the, the facts, and, facts are different in this, different in this situation. So, like I said, we just don't have a lot of case law. Um, Josh, is there any parting points? Anyone listening, you want them to take away from this? Uh, no, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to chat. Um, I, I think, you know, um, we can all hope that this is a, a short-term situation. I mean, this is obviously a historic time. I mean, I think you could argue this is probably one, certainly one of, if not the most historic event in our lifetime. And uh, it's important we uh, keep a clear, sane head as 